I'm going to start, Laurie, okay? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming here. My name's Ian Everall. I'm the Executive Dean of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, and it gives me a huge amount of pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture uh, that's going to be delivered by uh, Laurie Rajendran. And um, Laurie is the, as all you know, the Van Gies Professor of Neurodegeneration and also the Deputy De Director of the UK DRI, that's the Dementia Research Initiative, here at the Institute. Um, he's a renowned expert in cell biology of Alzheimer's disease, and he studies the cellular and molecular underpinnings of both amyloid formation and synapse loss, which, as we know, characterizes Alzheimer's. In particular, his lab uses both cell and systems biology approaches to dissect out the complexity of the disease process. Laurie comes from Madras, now Chennai, and he did his bachelor's in biochemistry and his master's in molecular biology at the University of Madras and he received the university's first rank gold medal in both the bachelor's and master's degree. Then he did some pre-PhD studies at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. He did his PhD in immunology at the University of Constance in Germany and holds the record of finishing his PhD within two years. He went on to do a postdoc in cellular neuroscience focusing on the cell biology of amyloid production in Alzheimer's disease. He's one of the founding members of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, which I had to go up and look, actually. But um, it sounds very interesting. And he served on several boards of academic institutions and initiatives. He also has done an MBA from the London School of Economics and a degree in blockchain technology from MIT. Maybe you're going to tell us about blockchain technology. I don't know. Sorry. Maybe you're going to tell us about blockchain. <laughs> I will. I will. Yeah, OK. <laughs> He's won many awards and uh, honours, including the European Young Scientist Grand Prize, the German Neuroscience Society Schilling Prize, and the Brew Award, uh, etc., etc. And uh, he's featured in the 2009 World's Top 100 Scientists and is the founder and chairman of Science Matters, which I assume we're going to hear about again this evening. Um, and he's also open, um, the editor of the an open ac Next Generation Open Access uh, journal platform that publishes single observation in science and Eureka on a blockchain-based science publishing platform. And on the social side, he's the founder of the Raise Rural, a non-profit organization dedicated to support rural students in India to pursue research. And I think I've seen some photographs of that as well. To carry it on, uh, he understands uh, five to six languages to a varying degree in current learning Spanish. Is that working well? Okay, you <laughs> see. And has numbers of hobby, hobbies from gardening, jewellery design, through to cooking and uh, watching political comedy shows. Um, and thinking about the reason for longevity and the evolutionary reason behind the persistence of stupidity. <laughs> so, please join me in welcoming Lawrence to give us the, uh, his inaugural lecture, which is Science Matters to Alzheimer's Disease, a recount of my journey. Welcome, Laurie. <laughs> saying science matters, it's indeed one word, this is the journal, but science also matters to Alzheimer's disease. And I'm going to start by saying, um, yeah, there you go. I'm going to ask, can I ask you a question? Or is it just me? Great. Uh, how many of you want to publish in cell science and nature? How many of you want to cure diseases? How many of you actually think there's absolutely no connection between the two questions? So I, I want to I highlight, oh, sorry, do I have to switch on? Oh, yes? Great. I will do this. Great, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat those questions again. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I'm going to emphasize that there is this absolute disconnect between the preclinical research and the translational, uh, the actual thing that you know, cures Alzheimer's disease patients, there is this disconnect. And I want to understand why, and, and, and I've, thought quite, I've thought quite a bit about this. And I think there are, from my opinion, there are two reasons for this, right? Uh, we keep seeing almost every week in Guardian to New York Times to BBC that we have cured Alzheimer's disease in mice. Uh, we have cured Alzheimer's disease in cells, and uh, it goes all the way from you either transfuse blood from, from a young person to the old person, or you use antibodies, 
or even spot smoking, for example, is fantastic for Alzheimer's disease. And you want to keep seeing these uh, Alzheimer's disease as a breakthrough with cannabis treatment. But however, when you look at the actual data, when it comes to patients, you see that Alzheimer's disease is, is pretty much what, oh yeah, I gotta sit through this, yeah. You see, it's 89% in, 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 uh, in, in patients where you see that we haven't managed to cure even a single person of Alzheimer's disease, whereas we have made enormous progress uh, in, in other diseases, right, including HIV. And, and that is interesting, and, and, and the question is, why do, we, uh, why do we keep curing Alzheimer's disease in these models and, 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 and the lab? However, why do we not reach any form of uh, advancement when it comes to actual treatment and therapy in Alzheimer's disease? And, uh, and, and, and so this is the question that I pose, and I, I, I'm gonna argue that there are two reasons, fundamental reasons, at least from my side. It could be, it's not a fundamental truth, but from when I think about it, I think there are two reasons for this. One is irreproducibility in the preclinical research uh, that we do. And the second thing is the complexity of the disease that, uh, that in itself, right? And, uh, and, and when it comes to irreproducibility, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you one more question. I'll ask many questions to you. I'm a professor anyways. So uh, how many of you have heard this joke on capitalism? Have you? How many? Yeah, so uh, that's the traditional definition of capitalism. You have, um, you have two cows, uh, you sell one and buy a bull, you herd multiplies and the economy grows, you sell them and retire on income, right? This is the French form of capitalism is this. You have two cows, you go on strike, organize a riot, put in a yellow vest, and block the roads because you want three cows. And uh, this is the Swiss corporation. You have 5,000 cows. None of them belong to you, but you charge them, uh, charge the owners for storing them. And uh, this is Indian uh, corp uh, capitalism. You have two cows and you worship them. But let me introduce you to another insane capitalism, which I call it like the mad cow distan. Uh, capitalism, which is science publishing, right? Which is, uh, uh, which is this insanely capitalist market which has around 25, 000, uh, 25 billion dollar per year uh, turnover. And the publishers take around 50% of the profit, around 50% of profit, not just, you know, it's not just the revenue, but this 50% goes to the venture capitalist of science publish, academic publishing. And, uh, and the reason it's also very bizarre, and I did, I did an MBA, I did economics, uh, when I presented this as a paper, people just got blown away <laughs> that uh, academics would pay that much money to a single entity. And, and, and it, it's, as we all know, you know, we use either charitable organization funding or the funding from the public organization, public uh, taxpayers' money, and then we use that and then we use our brains to write a proposal or, or, or uh, experiment on our hypothesis and, you know, we write a paper, we make sure that the comma is in the right place and the references are formatted for that particular journal. If it's not, it goes back and forth. And then ultimately we go, it goes to the peer review and as you know, peer review is one of the worst forms of, uh, like most troublesome forms of, um, of, of quality control. And then when the paper finally get, gets accepted, we don't question that the publishers um, you know, uh, they, they didn't put any, any form of money or investment into the project, but this long loop of uh, peer reviewing process took not only time, but they also didn't pay even a single penny to the people who actually did work in terms of quality control. Uh, but at the, at, at the end of it, when, when we get a, an email saying, your paper is accepted, we are insanely happy. <laughs> we open champagne bottles. Uh, but we forget to notice that they ask for $2,000 to $5,000 for a single paper. And uh, it doesn't stop there, the capitalism. Actually, it goes on. When you publish, you give not only your best scientific work, but we also give $5,000 or $2,000 on top of it. And when we want to read that paper, when we want to access our colleagues from, from, uh, uh, from this, this next lab want to read it, my university, our university pays millions of dollars just to get access to, 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 to read, right? And that's 
what we call as this double to triple dipping that happens in this publishing market. And, and we, on the other hand, we never question these things. We are very happy opening champagne bottles uh, when our paper gets published. We don't ask what is the breakdown of the $5,000 for an open access journal which doesn't even have a printed edition, right? There is no copy. And they don't pay the peer reviewers. And, so, and, and, and I think this is something we have to ask. I want to also tell you that, that uh, even articles that are published in 1800, uh, uh, these are, again, uh, they are behind paywalls, and you would have to pay uh, money to access knowledge. And I think that is something interestingly uh, challenging to even accept that knowledge can be behind paywall. And I grew, I will tell you a little bit, I grew up in a slum in India, in Madras, and if there was money associated with it, if the education was not free in India, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. And, and I think this is something that bothers me, that there is not even, there is this war, there is this barrier for knowledge, the access to knowledge, but there is also a barrier that I will talk to you about, is the barrier to, 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 to create knowledge. There, there are rules and regulations in this scholarly space that says what can be published and what cannot be published. And uh, <clears throat> it's the UK number that you can see that, that this is just in the UK that significant portion, around like 10% of the funding from various organizations goes just to publishers. Right? And, and I think that's, that's something needs to change and we, we do this. We, I also want to tell you that, that um, when you look at the profit margins of BMW or Google or Apple that have insane amount of uh, uh, patents and a lot of employees and they have actual buildings and, and people who pay and they, sorry, they take around 10 to 29% profit. Whereas publishers take, this is an old number, now it's increased because of the open access stuff, it has increased to 40 to almost 50% profit just for publishers. And I think that's something that we need to think about. And that's, um, when I, when I look, at, uh, look at science publishing, and even if it is expensive, even if I pay $5,000, I want to ask this question, is the money worth my penny, right? It is okay if I paid, paid $2,000 for an Apple computer, does it work well? And in the case of uh, publishing, though we spend a lot of money and time and energy and resources just for publishing because publications are the currency for academia, we, when you look at it, uh, it's not entirely um, wonderful there. there is, the science still goes wrong. There is a retraction that is an increase. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we are publishing wrong things, but we are also uh, developing tools to, to identify fraudulent work or uh, um, bad work. But however, there, there is this retraction that goes, goes higher. And in my field, this, is the, these, this again gr grows in numbers as we talk that there are more attractions in the Alzheimer's field that you see here. Right. And, uh, and it, it, it could very well be that, that um, retractions, uh, they don't really mean that all the studies are done in a, in a, in a terribly, um, you know, in a manipulative way or like an abject manipulation was present, but it could range all the way from, you know, massaging the data a little bit, you know what I mean? Uh, removing the pot spoiler, removing negative data that contradicts to the hypothesis, even if it is a tiny, tiny figure of it, we remove them. We, we, this is the uh, pruning of the data that I call, or massaging or manipulating, all the way to actual uh, fabrication of data. And this is some of these examples in the fabrication of the data. And, and, and uh, this is something uh, interesting for me, that this is a paper that was published um, this data actually was published in two different journals, where you see here very clearly that, that uh, the authors are trying to say that uh, there are cells, oops, uh, there are cells that, that uh, have different shape, uh, at, uh, and these different shapes um, represent different stages, uh, stages in, the, in, the, in, in the cell uh, treatment. So, so you, you have like four different stages. I think that the authors, when they wanted to publish, Initially, they provided four cells, showing, uh, you know, cell shape number one looks like this at this stage, and two and three, four. And the peer reviewers must have asked, you know, it's not very clever if you just showed only four cells and show that they are all representing four different things. You have to show more cells in order to have statistical representation. 
the author said, hold my beer. And they went and uh, copied the one and then pasted it uh, uh, on a black background and reduced the sizes. So if you look at all the one, they're exactly the same cells copied and pasted multiple times against a black background. Two is exactly the same, and four is exactly the same, and three is the same. So I'm trying to tell you that there are wonderful ways of uh, manipulating, including the stupid one where people think that this is, this is acceptable. And I think it is easy for us to blame the authors. It's blame the researchers saying that you know, they are immoral, they do something wrong, but I think it is also it is also imperative on us to, uh, to ask this question, why do people behave the way they do? Why do people manipulate scientific data when, uh, when they are not bankers? If they are, if they are bankers then, and, and, uh, and they cheat, then you understand that there is a financial gain. Why do scientists do? And I think I do want to argue that there is, these, there is this idea of incentives associated with publishing. Uh, at these places. It is not about, it's not almost, uh, it is not mostly about what you publish, but where you publish. And, uh, and, and the incentives could go all the way from, as you see here, this impact factor that we worship as, as uh, is one of the ma main things, all the way to if you're in Beijing, and if you have just published a nature or a science paper, you could get a wonderful discount. Uh, it's a total bill minus impact factor into 10 in your, uh, in a restaurant bill, right? The incentive could be actually feeding you back <laughs> by publishing, publishing in, in, in higher journals. And this, this restaurant is called Lancet Barbecue, right? And, uh, and, and I think that's, that is something interesting to think about as to that we are in this race to have, uh, to satisfy the, the, uh, the criteria for the career development to, to or F guidelines too. And an impact factor comes in very handy or where you publish as opposed to what we publish. And, and, <clears throat> and uh, this, this brings me to this economist um, law or a rule or uh, Gerhard put wonderfully that when a measure becomes a target, if that's what we want to achieve, then it ceases to become good measure. Right. If our goal is to have impact factor, then, then it does cease. And I think this is an extremely important aspect to think about. If I am working on a disease, particularly Alzheimer's disease, I, have, I could do two things. One is that I could cure the disease. Right. I, could, I could do work in terms of curing the disease, not care too much about what I publish. However, as an individual in an academic space, I could go very, very far if I didn't think too much about the, uh, the disease side, but if I published very well. Right. And I think this is something that we have to, uh, it, is, uh, it, 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 it is not very, uh, how do you say, um, the positive uh, study, but, but this is something that we have to think about, that when it comes to an individual's contribution to, the re to research, it's, in, it's like in game theory. Do I, should I be selfish or should I, should I contribute to the society? And, and I think this is something which is extremely important to think about, that, that when we have such measures becoming targets and goals and this is what we have to achieve, uh, uh, how does it contribute to the larger good of it or the larger goal of curing diseases? And, uh, and so anyway, so this is something that I will, uh, I'll wrap up in, in saying that there is indeed around like 90% of the people do think that there is reproducible crisis in preclinical research and in academic research. And, um, and, and, and this is not my slide, this is a, this is a, a, a survey conducted by Nature uh, among postdocs and early career researchers. And this slide is one of the most important slides uh, in my talk. And this worries me quite a bit that it says that among the early career researchers, they think that it is more important to publish first. The incentives to be first outweighs the incentives to be right. And if this is what we, we, uh, 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 we train, I think that it, there is something fundamentally wrong in, that, uh, in, in the way that we teach. And we, so one uh, important thing is that, uh, um, that, that 
while this is something that every academic uh, would know that we have, if we take all the data that we have in the lab, that going from one-off experiments that are completely, you know, uh, just bullshit, it just, uh, it, it, it should not belong to the scholarly space. And there are other results, but, and then there is this 10% story worthy, this sensationalizing results. And we publish these 10% of these things, and the rest of it stays in the lab. These are these, these are uh, data that is largely, uh, you know, negative results to, to contradictory and confirmatory results. We never publish, but we often have um, these story worthy uh, results that we publish. And, 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 and of course, this is this great thing that, they, you know, earlier it used to be this, I must find the explanation for this uh, in, in order to truly understand nature. I must get the result that fits the narrative in order to get to nature. And, uh, and, and, and so this is the Vox article that was covered um, a few years ago when we, when we launched Science Matters, that, that if you are an Alexander Fleming today, if, or if you have an Alexander Fleming in your lab today, that the simple observation that there was this fungal extract that killing bacteria, you couldn't publish this today. In 1928, Alexander Fleming could publish in general of bacteria, this bacteriology, the single result. In today's world, if I find something similar, or if my lab colleagues find something similar, and then we say, wow, now there seems to be a result that is, you know, that could change humanity's lifespan. And um, if I went and submitted that particular result, what Alexander Fleming did, one of the main peer review questions is, what is the mechanism? Uh, uh, behind this thing, and uh, what is that compound, for for example, or or if you aim something higher, like science or nature uh, or or you know nature medicine, you would have to cure half the population of Africa today in order to in order to have a figure five in that paper in order to get it published. And I think this this something worries me that there is a desire to tell stories from the scientist side but also there is a demand from the publisher side to tell these stories and i think when it comes to stories we often do prune and massage the storyline and the narrative in order to have uh, it as a story and as a result we might include things that do not really belong to the narrative but we also would remove things that that we think that doesn't belong to it and uh, and uh, <clears throat> And in this case, both the desire from the uh, scientist side and the demand side, it, one of the things it also does is that it also makes science closed for a long time, right? Not only that the publishers put a paywall and say that this science is closed until you pay money to access, I think we also, part researchers also participate in this, in this uh, um, close, uh, closeness of science by keeping the data as close as possible until a storyline is, is ready, and only then we publish. And, I, and, and so, um, so I started Science Matters, uh, because science should matter, I think, for publishing. And uh, to, to say that we could publish these single observa or observations, and not necessarily single data, it doesn't mean single data, but it, this is like a figure one of a paper, for example, that, that it tells it tells a phenomenon, there is an observation, and, uh, and without a story line in a way, that you don't tell the full story uh, right from the start, but you say what, is, what you're comfortable with. And, and there is no need for a story, so there is no need to make up a story. And uh, so, I mean, when I started, and then I was invited to many uh, institutions to talk about it, and also at the European Commission, people say, oh wow, this is a, cra this is a cool idea. Uh, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, I have to say, this idea is not, I mean, I, I did think that it was my, you know, original novel idea, but in the 19, uh, in 1665, Robert Hooke, the father of modern cell biology, said this, the truth is the science of nature has already been too long made only a work of the brain and the fancy. It is now high time, in 1665, it's now high time that it should return to the plainness and soundness of observations on material and obvious things, 1665. And I wanna just change one thing. If you changed here, the, sci uh, the off to or, the truth is the science or nature has been already too long made only a work of the brain and the fancy. It is now high time to return to the plainness and uh, simple uh, soundness of observations. Clearly putting this emphasis not on the story, 
but on science itself. And science for me is more related to data as opposed to the story that we, we often say. Uh, and, and, and so once, so we created this platform where you could just um, uh, put these observations and, add, and then you extend these observations. And once it's done, it's a bit like Lego, others could also incorporate their observations onto these, this network. As a result, all observations, not only positive, but also negative and the confirmatory and the contradictory, all of these observations are put together in a collaborative way and we tell a story together in time, right? And in this way, the story doesn't look beautiful, it doesn't look very pruned and, and made up, but it is the natural emergence of the narrative that actually tells the whole truth and not just the positive side of the truth. Right, there is a 360 degree view of science that we could have, but today, in, in today's world, we are often forced to tell only the positive side and only the positive side of, of this. Of this. So, uh, and, and so this is Science Matters. Uh, and uh, how, do we, how can we use blockchain on it? Right? Blockchain is essentially a new form of internet that is more distributed than how it is today. <clears throat> In simple terms, if I have to explain that, I just have to borrow an example from uh, the, the financial institution. In fintech, blockchain is a big thing, and blockchain is primarily uh, invented in a way or uh, described to be utilized in the financial institutions, where if I were to transfer, let's say, $100 to in, 100 pounds to in, no, in the UK, uh, uh, then I would have to go to a financial intermediary, like a bank, for example, that acts as a middleman to facilitate the transaction. That's what we do, right? Or, and, in, uh, and in this case, there is this middleman who, who facilitates the transaction, and who validates the transaction. Yes, Laurie did give this money to Ian, and he received it. But now, we could also do the other way. We could say, I could already transfer directly a peer-to-peer -peer transaction of money if not just one institution, but imagine 1,000 people look at the transaction and say, yes, he did send and he did receive. You understand? If the data is distributed, and if it is validated by 1,000 people or millions of people around the world, um, and that is enabled by blockchain by giving a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage in terms of cryptocurrency. And uh, so when I read this paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, in, um, uh, 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 when I was a sabbatical in the EPFL, I thought we could also do the same thing, that what I do in terms of publishing is nothing but I am transacting uh, something of scientific value from me to the reader. And why do I have to use a middleman like publisher if I could use thousands of uh, scientists around the world who could validate this transaction? And so that's exactly what we do with Eureka, which is, which is here, that uh, Science Matters is today and tomorrow it'll be Eureka if, if we could use blockchain, where immediately as soon as we make discoveries, we make, um, uh, we want to tell something to the world and we have finalized and validated, then this could be on a blockchain, which means that there is a timestamp and it's distributed all around the world. And you cannot mutate it back. You cannot go back and say, oh, uh, if, if the reviewer says, you know, this data is, is not, you cannot go back and, and mutate. If it is mutated, then you would have to change in thousand different computers. That's why blockchain is a very strong form of internet which does not rely on centralized regulation and governance, but distributed governance. If you need more, David Boyle, who is here, a colleague of mine, uh, who, can, who can talk to you more, and I can also talk to you more on another day. Today, uh, so that's the blockchain thing, which is, which is extremely interesting because it, it goes into this immutability of data and, and, and distributed governance, which also enables and ensures transparency in terms of these transactions, be it financial transaction or scientific transaction. I'm, I'm here, so if you, if you come by, I'll, um, I'll tell you more. <clears throat> so I'm gonna switch gears here and tell you um, the next few minutes about the Alzheimer's research that we do, and what we did, and, and what we plan to do here. So this is, um, the, the, this is my previous lab, um, most of them here, Nritin Joy, who just, uh, who just joined my lab as a postdoc here, uh, did a fantastic PhD, uh, fantastic PhD in my lab. Uh, uh, Paolicelli, she was a postdoc who did the microglia work, and uh, Jitin, who did the discovery of the nutrient sensing pathway in neurons, and Marcus Tsioras from Taras Pass Jones in Edinburgh. He did uh, the actual, 
uh, he did most of the immunohistochemistry uh, in the Alzheimer's disease patient brains that you would see. And this is my um, lab here. This is in, at the K1 and 28 at the Morris Old Building. Uh, this is my first lab meeting. Was it a first lab meeting? Yes. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is Shiden, my PhD student. This is Ivo, also a PhD student, Jackie, who, is, uh, who we hope that she joins me as a lecturer. And, um, and Carla, who is my, uh, my assistant in, in the lab. They do wonderful work in terms of setting up the lab. And we have made some inroads into, into, uh, into the actual science that we do at Kings. Uh, let me quickly tell you what we are interested in the science part of it. Right. <clears throat> That was Science Matters, and I do think science matters much, much more to Alzheimer's disease than publishing. Uh, and, uh, and I want to take this opportunity to really, really emphasize that, that often it goes very far away from what we actually want to do. Uh, uh, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, as you know, this is a neurodegenerative disease that occurs in, in, in an age-dependent fashion where proteins misfold and aggregate in, in the brain, and as a result, or and as a consequence, there seems to be uh, memory loss and cognitive dysfunction. We don't really exactly know how this aggregation of these proteins translate or transpire this cognitive dysfunction, but we know that these processes are concordant with the cognitive dysfunction that we see. Um, very often that it's told and, and it is emphasized that the, a peptide called the amyloid beta peptide, which is around 37, anywhere between 37 to 43 amino acid long, that can be, um, that uh, uh, this, this peptide gets aggregated in these block-like structures that you see here. And, and, and there is also the other protein called the tau protein, which normally stabilizes microtubules. This also falls apart and then aggregates it in the, in the neurons. In, uh, in Alzheimer's disease patient brains. And we think that, people think that the, uh, these amyloid aggregation is causatively linked, though we don't really exactly know for sure if this is the case. When Alzheimer's described the disease, not only he did, the, uh, he described these two protein, uh, the peptide and the protein aggregation, but when you look at his original monographs or the, these, these uh, uh, diagrams, you start to see that there are uh, he already described at the time in 1906 that there are these microglia structures, uh, microglia cells that seem to be largely phagocytic. There seems to be more phagocytic structures associated with microglia. And there is also enlarged endosomal or lysosomal uh, structures that he saw at the time. And, and, and so we are very fascinated in my lab to understand what exactly the cell, cell biological mechanisms underlying these pheno phenotypes and to see if that can be translated in terms of A, understanding the disease uh, uh, for early diagnostic, can we design early diagnostic basis based on such uh, phenotypes, and B, can we come up with a cure or prevention regimen? And you'll see uh, here. So uh, I'm going to just quickly run down to say that there are several uh, um, studies that we, we, we've conducted and we've pu published. And uh, what we've shown here is that there is, uh, we looked at the production side of the peptide, how the peptide is getting produced and how that can be translated. And also I'll tell you that we have discovered new mechanisms that are associated with the clearance and, 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 and clearance of A beta and the synapse loss in Alzheimer's disease. So one of the main questions that we ask, the, the, almost the main uh, focus is really, how does this amyloid aggregation, these protein aggregations, occur in the late onset form of Alzheimer's disease? It is the form of Alzheimer's disease that occurs in around 95% of the population, or 98% of the population, which do not contain mutations, right? Uh, in the absence of mutations that occurs in, in uh, the mutation form of Alzheimer's disease called the familial Alzheimer's disease, occurs only in 2% of the population that, uh, that can explain how we get more of this A beta peptide, but in the 98% of the Alzheimer's patient cases, there are no mutations. There are no autosomal dominant mutations that are associated with the production of the peptide. And so we ask this question, how did these patients, in the absence of mutations, still manage to get this plot-like structure or these 
uh, um, aggregation of these proteins. And, 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 and so we started by looking at cells um, where, where we did a lot of live cell imaging and, and combined with live cell and FRET and looked at how the production pathway occurs. And we found that in, uh, in, uh, when you look at the internalization pathway, it is not that uh, as the proteins are producing the biosynthetic pathway, it's actually the opposite side. When the proteins, the, the substrate APP and the enzyme beta secretase or base one, when they actually travel, re-internalize from the plasma membrane inside the cell, uh, as you can see, sorry, as you can see here that on the cell surface, there is hardly any co-localization between these two proteins. This is the substrate and the enzyme that APP is a substrate and the base is the enzyme. And on the surface, we didn't see any co-localization nor on the way to the surface from ER and Golgi. However, when you cross-link them and make them internalized, then you start, this, you start to see this fantastic co-localization in, inside these endosomal structures. And, and um, that was the start of my career where uh, when, when I started my postdoc, I, um, I started by looking at small lipid assemblies in, in the cell surface. And for a year, I only worked on quantifying this. And when the project didn't go, uh, it didn't go very well, actually. So I was just using, uh, I, I didn't, you, I was not studying Alzheimer's disease. I was studying these lipid assemblies on the cell surface. And uh, in one of the seminars, I, uh, there, was a, there was a guy who, who uh, talked about Alzheimer's disease and uh, talked all, all about A beta. And I asked a question as to, it's all great, but where is this A-beta getting produced? Like, you know, where, and, and, and when he said that they didn't know at the time, I went to my boss and said, I want to work on this project. And uh, this was one of the first results where we could show that uh, indeed in the endosomal structures, in the endocytic pathway, that's where the A-beta peptide gets, uh, gets produced. And it was also interesting because, um, because we know that the enzyme that you see here, that this is the APP molecule, this is a substrate, as I told you before, and beta secretase is, is an enzyme, it's also a type 1 transmembrane protein, and it cleaves here to release uh, uh, an ectodomain and, uh, and the membrane bound form, which gets cleaved by the second enzyme to release this A beta peptide, which then misfolds and forms these blocks. Uh, and, and when we found that it is indeed in the endosomal pathway, in the endocyte, early endosomes, that um, that the beta secretase cleavage occurs, it explained a lot of things, including the fact that the beta secretase is, is an aspartic enzyme which requires a lower pH. What it also explained is that um, most of the drugs that were in silico um, synthesized, the inhibitors that would inhibit the beta secretase, they were in silico designed, and when they were uh, tested in in vitro, almost every almost every inhibitor worked in the in, in vitro conditions. However, when we translated it, when we put them into the cells, 99% of these inhibitors fail to inhibit beta secretase in a cellular context. And so we reasoned because, our, because of a study that showed indeed in the beta secretase is not active on the cell surface, but it cleaves the uh, APP protein only in the endosomal compartment. We reasoned that perhaps we need to take these inhibitor also into the endosomal compartment as the membrane, uh, uh, membrane associated form of beta secretase is inactive. And so we designed an inhibitor that, that would go all the way from, from the cell surface by taking an inhibitor that was designed by Merck, which was cell impermeable. It, it, it inhibited beta secretase in vitro in, in vitro. However, it failed to reduce it in, in the cells. We took exactly the same inhibitor, but now attached it to a cholesterol molecule, right? So attaching it to lipid made sure that the inhibitor uh, is now, um, it, 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 um, it localized to the membrane, and then it got internalized into these endosomal compartment. Pretty much the same, uh, it used the same trafficking pathway like the enzyme as a result the inhibitor came in, in close association or the vicinity to the enzyme in the, active, uh, in the active localization. And so we tested this inhibitor. It's possible that, that, the, uh, that the membrane tethered version could be trafficked to the endosomal compartment and then get access to the active version of the enzyme that is present here. And, and that's what we see here, that, that this is the free version that the Merck synthesized. It's, you can see here that uh, the inhibitor treated cells 
fail to inhibit beta secretase because in the green you see that the cleavage still happens, the A beta still gets produced. However, if you anchor this inhibitor, it almost significantly wipes out beta secretase activity in cells, right? Because we, um, we made sure that there, there is the availability of the inhibitor in the exact subcellular compartment where the enzyme is active, which also makes, uh, made us to think that when we think about bioavailability of drugs and compounds, we often describe bioavailability by looking at the concentration of the compound in the peripheral uh, circulation. As, as soon as it reaches the blood, then we think bioavailability is 100, 100%. However, here is a, is a fantastic case where you see that even if the drug is sitting on the membrane, if even it manages to pass the blood-brain barrier, goes into the brain, and it sits on the neuronal membrane, it still is not bioavailable uh, as the inhibitor that is sitting on um, the inhibitor that, um, that can see the enzyme on the cell surface is still an inactive version of it. The active version is sequestered somewhere inside the endosomal uh, or intracellular compartment. And, and now this um, methodology is used by many others, including he uh, hepatitis B virus, uh, uh, as well as HIV, for example, by membrane tethering these inhibitors, uh, allowing it to go to this intracellular compartment. And, and so this is, this is what we did. And, and, and uh, in this context, we also co-crystallized um, beta secretase and uh, did crystallography in terms of looking at how the beta secretase uh, binds to these inhibitors, but at the same time also co-crystallized uh, beta secretase with different physiological substrates and looked at what distinguishes between the cleavage uh, uh, cleavage chemistry between the enzyme and, and the amyloid substrate like APP or um, the enzyme and the physiological substrate, the non-amyloid substrates of, of beta secretase, including neuroglin, for example. And we found that there are interesting differences between these two, and that endosomal localization only permitted the cleavage of APP, but not the other substrate. So targeting endosomal beta secretase helped not only having this effective inhibition of APP, but also prevented the enzyme, inhib uh, enzyme cleavage of um, uh, the, uh, prevented the inhibition of the enzymatic cleavage of the physiological substrate. So the physiological substrate cleavage still went on, but it specifically inhibited the APP cleavage, which I think it's extremely important as it also reduces the side effects that one sees. So we went on to, so once we identified that, that this is in the endosomal localization that cleavage occurs, uh, we could also make an inhibitor that would go uh, specifically to this compartment. And we also looked at how is this peptide that is generated in the luminal side of the endosomal compartment, how does it get out in order to form these amyloid blocks and, and discovered a new pathway. At that time it was new, it was in 2004, we discovered that it is the exosomal route where, the, uh, where we showed that the uh, limiting membrane of this endosomal compartment can, can invaginate and form these, these tiny vesicles inside this endosomal compartment. And once this endosomal, uh, uh, these limiting membrane can fuse with the plasma membrane, it can release these vesicles out as these exosomal compartment, which now is known to, 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 to be important for uh, bringing out my, uh, microRNAs and mRNAs, and also in a non-hormonal, non in a new kind of endocrine mechanism that involves vesicular, um, vesicular route. And, and I want to tell you that, that um, when we discovered that, this, that it is in the endosomes of the neurons that A beta peptide is produced, the peptide is generated there. At the time, it was known that um, the 2% uh, familial disease that I told you that is, off, that is uh, um, mainly due to, or uh, it is due to the mutations. Uh, we know that the mutations affected the production of the peptide. We didn't know for the 98% whether it is actually production or any other mechanism. And so we looked at the GWAS set of data that is associated with looking at risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease and looked at uh, whether the newly identified GWAS risk genes, if they affected the production of the peptide or some other mechanism through which this uh, um, Alzheimer's disease, late onset <laughs> Alzheimer's disease mechanism works. And, and, and so we, we looked at most of these uh, we looked at all of these, um, these risk genes, and we did a simple screen where uh, this was done just in, 
like a month of study, and, uh, and, and showed this fantastic negative result that said, unlike these mutations, that PS2 or PS1 mutations that are associated with the familial form of the Alzheimer's disease that change the production kinetics, that, that you see this production is changed, all the risk genes of late onset Alzheimer's disease that we looked at, they did not significantly affect the production. Right? They, uh, unlike the mutations, the risk gene, uh, the, the genes associated with the elevated risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease did not affect uh, the, the production mechanism at all. And that was surprising, but it's also an extremely important result that while we have this desire to always link genes to amyloid production, and we think that if it is Alzheimer's risk uh, gene, then it needs to be linked to amyloid production. Here's a clear result that we see now, uh, both in, in non-neuron cells as well as neurons, that they don't really affect the production of a mechanism. So if it is not production, how do these risk genes affect Alzheimer's disease? And, and so we went back to this cartoon that I always uh, uh, put in so many uh, of the reviews, I reuse them, uh, and, uh, and, and really questioned the canonical knowledge that we now have of Alzheimer's disease. In one of the cases is that, uh, the consensus that we have is that in the neurons, we have this production pathway that this APP and the enzyme, they are internalized and the enzyme cleaves here to produce this A beta peptide, both beta secretase and the gamma secretase cleave the APP to reduce this APP, A, A beta peptide, and the A beta peptide is then secreted out. And now comes the second thing, that once it is secreted, then the non-neuronal cells in the brain, particularly microglia and to some extent astrocytes, they can take up this A beta peptide and clear them. So there is this bipartite relationship that one sees that there is clearly a, a production unit that is largely neurons, and there is a clearance that is non-neuronal or the extra, extra neuronal. In fact, and, and, and when we looked, and this is also the reason why we think that non, uh, the neuroinflammation, for example, that could affect microglial clearance, and there are many risk genes that are newly identified risk genes for late onset Alzheimer's. They are all linked to somehow immune cell function and neuroinflammation, and, and they are also expressed in microglia. Now, when we did this, uh, we asked this, uh, we shouldn't have, uh, we, sh we should have asked this question, but we kind of asked this question too long, uh, that is, uh, when we try to put these cartoons, and then there is this A beta that is generated in the endosome, I have bored you by saying this for like a thousand times that you all know. Where is A beta produced? Where is A beta produced? In the endosomes, right? And, 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 but we didn't ask this question very early enough that there is a tiny organelle here called lysosomes in the neurons. This organelle is pretty much like a microglia, a tiny microglia sitting inside, uh, inside a neuron trying to eat all this. This is the suicidal bag that contains all the digestive enzymes, cathepsins, and, 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 and several proteases. But uh, so we asked this question as to why doesn't this A beta peptide that is generated here, why is it not cleared by the lysosomes in the neurons? Why would it have to depend on extra neuronal, uh, another cell like microglia in order to be clear. So this question started, uh, uh, so we, we, uh, we then realized that perhaps something uh, that the cell experiences that somehow <clears throat> keeps the lysosomal degradation at bay, that it somehow it is, it's reduced or inhibited, and as a result this A beta peptide uh, uh, doesn't get released, uh, uh, it gets released but it doesn't get degraded inside the neurons. And so we did this screen by knocking down every single kinases, uh, every single kinase in the, in the, in the human genome and, and knocked it down. Uh, uh, or we either knocked it down using saRNA, four different saRNAs, and, and did a screen and looked at whether this A beta peptide uh, is, is decreased even before uh, having uh, access to microglia. Can the neurons themselves degrade uh, degrade A beta, uh, uh, and we also combine this RNA ice cream because they have off-target effects by ad uh, additionally including uh, in a paired manner also kinase inhibitors. So not only we uh, reduce the 
genetic, at the genetic level, the mRNA, but also kept the mRNA and the protein, but inhibited only the activity, hoping to see parallel uh, or overlap in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the hits that we saw. And in both screens, what we found was phenomenal that we found that nutrient sensing pathway, um, when this is the pathway that is located on the lysosomal membrane that you see here, that if the, if the cells experience or if the cells have enough of amino acid and insulin, then it transcriptionally blocked the production of lysosomes, the new synthesis of lysosomes. Uh, I don't have the time to go through in detail, but you are very welcome to come to my lab or office at any time. Uh, you will see the entire path, so we delineated the entire pathway showing for the first time that indeed amino acids, if they are present, if the cells can sense amino acid and cholesterol, then it transcriptionally blocked the biogenesis of lysosomes as a result. And it kind of makes sense because if you already give amino acid from outside, the cell says, why should I put up a lysosome and, and, and have all these proteolytic enzymes to cleave proteins in order to make amino acid when I get amino acid from outside anyways? And it's like, you know, if my father gives enough money, why should I recycle my genes in eBay to get money, right? And, 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 and uh, so when, when we manipulated Different, um, different experimental conditions, we could clearly show that when you reduce amino acid or you starve or, or you inhibit the signaling pathway, then we saw this increased lysosomal biogenesis. And as a result, when there is enough lysosomes in the neurons, it started to sort this A beta peptide from the endosome already to lysosome, so we didn't see much of A beta coming out. So there is, it, is, uh, it gets degraded. So this is the pathway that we, we put together and, and, and so, uh, the, the idea is that if you, uh, if you had this starvation, this uh, should help, so, right? Like if fasting should help. And, the, and so we did this experiment where we said, oh, this is fantastic. We could just, you know, I, ideally starve cells. And when we starve the cells, the lighting is not uh, uh, perfect, but you can, you can take my word for it, that when we starve the cells, either using uh, the, what we call as the oriental way of fasting, this periodic fasting, or the chronic or the Abrahamic religion way of fasting. You know, uh, in both cases, what we saw is that there is an increase in lysosomal uh, content in the cells, and there is a decrease in these amyloid uh, proteins, which suggested that fasting is indeed very good. It's, it's uh, what conventional uh, religious wisdom says. It's not so bad, or cultural wisdom. And, and so this is all in cells, because we were trying to identify the intraneuronal clearance pathway, and it worked out pretty good. And, and so we said if we starve the cells or neurons, it is very good, but we cannot targetedly starve neurons in the brain. We would have to starve the whole organism. So we did this experiment where we used mice uh, and, 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 and looked at <clears throat> old mice and, and starved them. So we had a control where we didn't starve them, we fed them. And in the old mice, we starved the mice. And we found something interesting. So is here. If you need more details, you can ask him. And, uh, and that's the, so we clearly see that the A beta peptide uh, was reduced in the, in, also in the mice, which is very in alignment with, um, with our cell studies and also it reproduced our cell studies. And, and uh, we also see this increase in, in cathepsins and, and lysosomal content very clearly. You see the lamp 2 goes up uh, and, and cathepsins go up. However, something strange happened, a very disturbing thing happened, that when we looked at these spine numbers and synaptic proteins in the starved old mice, we saw that not only these lysosomal content and the enzymes go up, but also the synaptic proteins were reduced. And when we starved these old mice. So it seems like while fasting is very good for the neurons in a targeted way, as soon as you do it in the organismal context, it just went berserk and exactly the opposite way. That uh, while it was very beneficial for a beta peptide, it was detrimental for cognitive function or synaptic uh, uh, content. And, um, and this is reminiscent to the other study where we knocked down TDP43 in microglia in a, in a screen where we performed this a systems biology screen where we knocked down all these risk genes in microglia. 
and we identified the TDP43 when it was knocked down, it also reduced A beta peptide very clearly. So it, because there was a, uh, the microglia cleared A beta peptide and the content was low. Uh, but when we looked at the synaptic structures, then in the conditional knockout, you can clearly see the PSG95, the content is reduced and, 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 and synaptic structures were reduced here. This is VGLUT1. And uh, when we looked at the mechanism as to why these microglia, when they were starving, uh, when, when you manipulate nutrient sensing, it turned out that microglia, when they starve, they started to eat almost everything indiscriminately. So far we can see that on one hand they would clear a beta peptide, which should be beneficial, but on the other hand, they also ate synaptic structures, which is definitely not what we want. And, and, and so <clears throat> you clearly see here, and so we come up with this idea that perhaps it is not this one or zero mechanism in Alzheimer's disease. When you, if, um, um, if, if the disease starts, that, that if there is a, uh, that there are biphasicity, there is a biphasicity in, all, in, in the Alzheimer's disease process that perhaps in the first stage where there is amyloid formation, then it is largely an anabolic metabolism that, uh, that, um, that contributes where you have less lysosomes and more production of this A-beta peptide. However, in the later stages of aging, I think our body undergoes already anorexia. We start to eat less and there is anorexia of aging. And there is also hormonal control that, uh, that drives the body into more of catabolic process. And that's also the reason why we have bone that gets demineralized much, much more because you have higher activation of osteoclasts that we know. In the brain, I think there is a higher starvation of, of structures like microglia that start to eat, eat neuronal structures. And, uh, and so one possibility is that, uh, so that we looked at, sorry, excuse me. Uh, we looked at whether, um, if this is the case, then there should be a separation in terms of aging itself, that perhaps in the midlife or before 65, then there is a, a higher anabolic rate that produces more of the amyloid. And in the later stages, we should see exactly the opposite, that there is more catabolic side. And if there would be, if, um, if that's the case, then if, if we could offset this catabolism by having more amino acid in this stage or more uh, uh, cholesterol, then this should be offset. Which, in other words, it means that if you're, if you're thinner or if you're uh, um, lean, if you have lower BMI or lower cholesterol during the middle life, then it's actually good. However, when you get older, to be fat is not bad. Uh, it, it is, it is, it's probably better for cognition because the microglia are not starving and their uh, nutritional status uh, does not allow ex excessive pruning of synapses that could, uh, that could give rise to cognitive dysfunction that we see. So in order to really bridge our preclinical research to actual clinical data, we collaborated with three wonderful people. A wonderful set of people. One is Tara Spice Jones uh, uh, in, in Edinburgh, who did these experiments where uh, Marius Marcus uh, did this experiment where we looked at uh, brain uh, brains uh, uh, cells where uh, in the in the brain how much of synaptic pruning occurs in these cells, and we saw that indeed in AD there is a huge amount of synaptic protein engulfment, and and that's what you see very clearly. Um, and, uh, and what we also saw is that if you had hyperlipidemia, then the synaptic protein engulfment is reduced, right? Which pretty much goes in the way that if you, if you had lower levels of uh, lipids or excessive starvation phenotype in microglia, then there is excessive pruning that occurs, but that can be offset by having hyperlipidemia. And, uh, and this is from Marius and, and T is here, uh, T Yusuf is here. And, and they looked at ADNI data. We, could, we couldn't look at synaptic, um, synaptic loss in living patients. One day we could do, I hope, T. Uh, with the PET traces that Marius has developed for synaptic, um, uh, synaptic structures. Here, they, when we looked at the FDG PET, that clearly showed something interesting, that, um, that as the cholesterol levels go higher, one sees that the FDG PET uh, FTG, um, yes, 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the PET tracing, uh, the, the signal goes down or the mobilization of the glucose goes down. However, when this is all below 75, so below 75, the more cholesterol you have, less glucose utilization occurs in the brain. However, after 75, this is about the age of 75, this seems to be stabilized or even getting better. So there is this bifacity in which phase you are, whether you're uh, in the middle age or in the later stages of aging. And this is from um, the dog, uh, this is from uh, Ali Javed and Paul Schultz lab in the uh, Baylor College of Medicine, and I also collaborated with Dog Arsland, showing that indeed, if you have hyperlipidemia, when you look at yearly MMSE progression, above 75, it is actually protective, that you see that the progression is, is reduced, and, and again, here you see here the very clearly in the uh, with dog Austin that there is reduction in the, um, the that you have less less um, uh, progression if you have hyperlipidemia. That it goes back to saying that perhaps there is this really clear biphasicity in aging associated with Alzheimer's disease. That in the middle age, that uh, their anabolic metabolism, uh, the more anabolic metabolism perhaps contributes to the more production and less clearance of this peptide. However, in the later stages of aging, it is independent of the amyloid load, uh, where it becomes mostly microglia dependent, that even in the, in the absence of amyloid, or if in the reduction, with the reduction of amyloid, you still, if you have synapse loss, then it could contribute to uh, cognitive dysfunction. <clears throat> and, and I have this, uh, this, this theory that, that I think we could look at life in, from one cell to all the way to death in, in three different metabolic phases. The first phase, I call it the Brahma phase, which is if you are a Hindu or if you know about Hinduism uh, in the philosophy, Brahma stage is, Brahma is what the, the god of creation, which is what I call, which is largely anabolic dominant, where it goes from one cell all the way to, uh, uh, reproductively fit around like 15 to 18, uh, all the infrastructure that goes all the way to building this infrastructure. And then from 18 to 65 or 70, we live in this, what I call as Vishnu period, which is the uh, steady state or equilibrium period where we have to balance the anabolic metabolism with the catabolic metabolism, which the exercise to, to, uh, to fasting, to all these mechanisms that make, make us balance to keep that pretty much in the, in, this, in the equilibrium state and the later stages of it. I think we have mechanisms that actually want to make us go. And, and that would be largely catabolic, uh, catabolic uh, catabolism dominant. And we know that in the later stages of aging, you have higher autophagy and higher lysosomal biogenesis. We have things eating our own blood, uh, uh, bone and muscles. And now we can also demonstrate that pretty similar catabolic processes are involved in synaptic loss, which could give rise to the, the um, cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive dysfunction. And so one could now think about how do we offset that catabolic uh, process? Can we feed the elderly and, and fast the middle age? In, in that way, could we extend even life? Uh, or could we even extend synaptic, uh, um, synaptic stability? So I think I am pretty much close to the end of it. So that's, that's uh, the, the, this is what we want to do in, 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 um, at the King's, is really by using iPS-derived neuron microglia co-culture uh, that Shiden, who is here, she's uh, from Eritrea, is a, uh, and, and, and Ivo uh, from the UK, now we'll work together in terms of, look, can we make patient-derived mini brains or like going towards this mini brains to look at this bipartite relationship between neuronal amyloid clearance and microglial mediated synapse loss. And also look at, look at if it is possible to make lysosomal traces uh, to stage and to understand the disease way earlier than amyloid production. We think that this could be the earliest marker for, for the disease progression, be it Alzheimer's or uh, even in ALS and FTD. So my lab is trying to design a lysosomal tracer, a PET tracer for lysosomal function. And ideally, we would like to offset this catabolic uh, process 
by, uh, by manipulating this nutrient sensing <coughs> pathway that exists so that synapse can be stabilized. <coughs> so th thank you, Laurie. Um, it, it's usual to say at this point, I apologize for standing between you and drinks, but actually I don't. Um, and I'm not going to apologize at all. It, it's absolutely an, an honor and a privilege to follow that. Um, and your, your, the contribution started with reflecting on some of the risks about creating stories and not telling the truth. And you end up with uh, you know, a really extraordinary personal account and a very truthful and moving account. Uh, and, I, and I think it just does reinforce the importance of knowing what the story should be. Uh, and, and telling it in, in a heartfelt and truthful way. So, so thank you very much for that, Laurie. It, it's also an opportunity to say something that uh, I hope we've said several times before, which is welcome to King's. Thank you. Um, and we, we don't do sufficient inaugural lectures. I think there are many of us who are professors, me included, who've, who've never stood up and given an inaugural lecture. I, we, we are changing that, exactly. So I really want this to become part of the culture, that we take the opportunity on a regular basis as, as new professors are appointed to gather together as a community and hear that person's story. Uh, and the small number of inaugural lectures I've been to have often been a combination of the personal journey and the scientific journey. Um, and, and it's a unique opportunity to, to hear that. So I think we should do that much more often. Um, it's, it's also an opportunity for us to reflect on what a long journey it's been to get to a position where King's is absolutely a world-leading center in neurodegeneration and dementia research, where we can attract and recruit and retain some of the best scientists from around the world. It, it was not a short journey. Um, Chris Shaw, unfortunately, can't be here, and, and I know he sent apologies to you, but, but he's away at a, at a, at a DRI event today. Uh, but some of you may know, some of you may not know, that the Morris Wall Clinical Neurosciences Institute was probably conceived about 17 or 18 years ago uh, through a conversation between Alan McGregor, who was the campus dean of KCL at the time, and Malcolm Lowe Laurie, who actually was the chief executive of King's College Hospital. Uh, and they hatched the original idea and drew Chris in very early on as the person who would lead and drive and, and make it happen. Uh, and, you know, 17 years later, we're now in the building. We've had an amazing gift from the Van Gies Foundation, which, which funds your position. Uh, we had a number of really extraordinary gifts from donors, uh, as well as from the various institutions, from KCL, KCH, uh, SLAM and others. Um, and we're now in an amazing facility with uh, labs that are superbly equipped and great people. Um, so the future looks exciting. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have you with us, Laurie. Uh, and you know, we are your friends and colleagues and family, and I, and I hope we won't be strangers, all of us, for, oh, I, for, I like for, for too much longer. <laughs> But, but there will be new people coming along all of the time, and, and we look forward to, to more inaugurals. But we, we won't forget yours, Laurie. So, so thank you very much, thank and you. welcome. Thank you.